Welcome to Secular Law, a major victory for the ACLJ, a major victory for the American worker at the U.S. Supreme Court. Two-thirds of the American workforce was beginning to comply with the Biden administration's vaccine mandate. And for most of you uh, and your employer, that meant that you either had to show your vaccine card and prove to your employer that you were vaccinated. The employer had to build a new database of people who were vaccinated and then make sure, you know, that was ready in case the definition might have changed, you know, later on to having to have to have a booster shot to be considered fully vaccinated. And then you were also for if you if you wanted to allow the option, you could either terminate the employers who weren't vaccinated or you were allowed the option of weekly testing and masking at a time when you it's very difficult to even find those tests and you'd have to have a database of testing. This even applied, as the Supreme Court noted, to only 9% of landscapers and groundskeepers would be considered outdoor workers for this not to apply. Think about that. Lifeguards at the pool this summer, they would actually be considered indoor employees because there is some time where they might be inside. For landscapers, it's because they, they spend some time in vehicles right. together. But the Supreme Court, in a resounding 6-3 decision, told the Biden administration that OSHA and this agency – under the Department of Labor, does not have the constitutional power or the authority under statute to implement this kind of widespread mandate. And again, I want to just reinforce, this was a victory for two-thirds, nearly 100 million American workers and their employers who won't have to be in this bizarre employer-employee relationship, which I'll tell you, folks— was was becoming very bizarre. Yeah, well, we were having to do it. Yeah, I mean, and, it's just and weird. Employees couldn't get. I mean, there were employees that could not get the, of course, couldn't get tested because the tests weren't available. So that was one. And then at the same time, you had the situation. There was not a lot you could do about it. Uh, and we have a very high vaccination rate actually here, but um, it made it very difficult for these employees to, to, to do. We had to create this database. Let me say what what happened here. I hope that this decision, and I really believe this is going to happen, depoliticizes this issue, and I think it does. It's not, it's not a mandate, so no one can make you do it. You do what's best for you. For me, that was getting vaccinated. Uh, that's a decision that I made based on my advice with my doctor and the science. That's where I came out. But what this does is the government never had the authority. This was what we argued, that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration did not have the statutory authority to do this and that they overreached by doing it. And six justices, Andy, of the Supreme Court agreed with us. That's exactly right, Jay. The gravamen of the opinion, the heart of the opinion, was that the Congress did not give the Labor Department through the OSHA, the Occupational Safety Health Administration, the statutory or regulatory authority, I should say, to uh, interfere in the mandating of vaccines or testing or any of those things that they attempted to do because it just wasn't in the congressional mandate. And what Congress gave was not that power. That power was not given to OSHA. Therefore, OSHA had no authority to regulate and to interfere in that particular thing. It was a resounding victory, in my view, for the Constitution of the United States because it emphasized the fact that only delegated powers by the states to the federal government apply, and even then the federal government has limited authority under what it can do and give to its agencies, Jay. Yeah, and let me say, I see it a lot in the chat. There's the, the, the uh, There was a second case. It was not the same case. Okay, we were not a part of it. We represent the Heritage Foundation, private employers. About the medical employers, they, that was a separate, and their employees, a separate case entirely. And by the way, if you work for one of those companies, not one of them, challenged it the challenges were coming from the states and, and individual employees your employer your hospital and the supreme court noted it unlike heritage who challenged it for their employees your employer didn't and the supreme court took note and it was right on the edge five four so if you're upset there i'd actually direct your anger towards your medical employer who decided not to challenge not this on your behalf yeah we'll be right back on secular Welcome back to Secu. We are going to take your phone calls, too, throughout the broadcast. Uh, we're going to be uh, joined by Kevin Roberts. He is the president of the Heritage Foundation. He'll be joining us later in the broadcast. Mike Pompeo later in the broadcast as well to weigh in on this. But I, I just kind of want to walk through, too, how quickly the ACLJ was able to engage with the Heritage Foundation. They came to us. They were interested in, in filing the challenge. It was the first time 
the Heritage Foundation ever went to federal court as the actual petitioner. They had filed a couple of amicus briefs before, but they had never been represented before federal court. That just wasn't something they had done before, and they decided this was important. This was so important that they wanted to do so, and they chose uh, the American Center for Law and Justice to represent them. So on November 29th, 2021, so uh, right after Thanksgiving holiday, the ACLJ filed a federal lawsuit in the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia on behalf of the Heritage Foundation. You have to file where they're based. On December 7th, uh, we filed the Heritage Foundation's opposition to the defendant's motion to dissolve the stay. Remember, the stay then was dissolved. Uh, that was uh, December 17th, 2021. Uh, the, the Sixth Circuit dissolved the stay. So uh, this was set it for uh, set the mandate to go into effect January 4th when people return to work after the New Year's holiday. On December 18th, this is, again, just the significance of the amount of work. And remember, we get to these dates. When you get to, when I talk about November 29th is when we filed. I'm telling you, there were, it was days in between. It was not weeks. Days our attorneys had uh, to get that ready. December 18th, uh, the ACLJ filed the Heritage Foundation's emergency application for stay of agency action at uh, the U.S. Supreme Court or a grant of cert. Uh, on December 20th, the case was docketed at the Supreme Court. Uh, the Heritage Foundation case, and Justice Kavanaugh said the governor, government's response would do was due by 4 p.m. on Thursday, December 30th. So Game 10 days we're all working Christmas. right through uh, every single holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. Uh, December 21st, uh, the Supreme Court announced that the oral argument would be on January 7th. Uh, that was last week. December 23rd, the, uh, so again, the two days before reply. Christmas, uh, or an order issued that a reply from us, if any, would be due on January 3rd, two days after New Year's Day. And the ACLJ filed on January 3rd, the Heritage Foundation's reply, and on January 13th, the application for stay was granted by the U.S. Supreme Court, and that was, of course, the victory yesterday. So I, when I need people to understand, I'd like everybody to understand, and again, none of this happens without our member support, because this, you know, we talk about Thanksgiving, so we're working on this right before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving comes, you're still working on it. You have Thanksgiving, and then you're still working on it. In a six-week period of time, we went from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States with a decision. So, I mean, you talk about record break speed. Um, we, Sean, Jordan and I did Sean Hannity's case yesterday, and we were talking about, you know, we've had about 20 wins at the Supreme Court, maybe a little bit more with the, some of the summary reversals we've gotten over the years, probably closer to 25 or 28. But, you know, and then I said, oh, wait a minute, no, we just got this one. So that's, you know, 20, 28, 9 now. And the, the fact is that this case moved at record speed, but we were very tailored in our approach. Because when, you, when you've lost a case in the lower court, what you want to do is somewhere in the opinion, you want it to say reversed or stay granted. And everybody's talking about, well, they could maybe they'll strike it down on constitutional grounds. We led with the lack of statutory authority, and this is what the Supreme Court said. OSHA has never imposed such a mandate, nor has Congress. Indeed, although Congress has enacted significant legislation addressing COVID-19, it has declined to enact any measure similar to what OSHA has done. We agree that the applicants are likely to prevail, and we grant their applications and stay the rule. And the court then went and said that because this did not apply just to the workplace. So that's what was so interesting about this. But we went for a very specific type of relief here, Andy, the stay based on a lack of statutory authority. We addressed the constitutional issues, of course, because you never know where it's going to go. But we focused on the statute. That's exactly right, Jay. The stay is what we wanted to have in place. That is the preclusion by the Biden administration of enforcing this uh, anti-COVID vaccine mandate testing stay that had been put into place. And we focused on what did the Congress give in terms of authority to OSHA, and the Supreme Court found that it did not give it authority to do anything other than occupational hazards and workplace safety. These were not, it's not a public health arm. It's not a public health institution. It did not have the authority to do that. And we focused very, very laser-like on the statutory authorities 
given by Congress to this agency, yep. and the Supreme Court found they did not have that authority, you can't do it. And we moved with lightning speed on this, Wes, as you saw. Yeah, there is no other organization that's positioned quite like we are to defend the Constitution and to represent the rights and freedoms of ordinary Americans, businesses and groups, even states and cities, through our our representatives in Congress that we have direct contact with, through advocacy in the media, through our FOIA requests, but especially in the courts, Jay. And, And we're defending the rights of ordinary Americans and our Constitution. And, Jay, it's all made possible Think about yes. this through donations, no, it's through no people question. who support the ACLJ. It's I, you amazing. Know, you, yeah, you all get the thank you here. I mean, we get to do the work because you're a supporter of the ACLJ, which is just incredible. So I'm, I'm going to say that throughout this entire broadcast. Thank you. I want to go to Than Bennett. It was interesting because the one thing that uh, the opinion does say is that while OSHA could not do this, uh, Congress might be able to do it, uh, or and certainly the states. And I think we all agree the states have the authority to do it under the police power. But you see nothing moving in Congress on this, correct? I mean, I think this issue is now depoliticized, and people will make smart decisions, I hope. Yeah, it's a major win all the way around. You know, I think there's a di- there's disagreements here in town on whether or not Congress should have the ability to pass a statute and do this. Uh, but the court, in its opinion, referenced that the Senate has actually taken a substantive vote on this. Uh, they voted on a sense of the Senate on what the, uh, whether or not the mandate uh, should stand. And there was actually bipartisan opposition to the mandate, Jay. The, the vote was 52 to 48. And the court recognized that that was the most significant vote that Congress had taken. So, look, e- even if even if Congress were to come back and say we want to implement this mandate statutorily and even if hypothetically the court would let that stand uh, Jay there just aren't the votes in either chamber to do that so we're not going to get a statutory mandate on this I feel very confident about that all right we're getting a lot of calls coming in Jordan we want to try to help people with questions they might have so let's go ahead and take them yeah Mike's calling from Utah online one hey Mike welcome to Seculo you're on the air thanks for taking my call um, I'm an embedded systems engineer. I work for a, a Fortune 150 uh, defense contractor. It was unclear to me, um, based on the things that I watched on the news and on your program, whether or not um, DOD contractors are going to be exempt from or, or part of this mandate still, or if we're going to, to be like uh, private industry. So and let, let me ask, uh, let me ask you this. Um, what is your, you, you work for a fi- private defense contractor though. So what is their policy? Um, I think they're going along with what the CDC says. And I think that they're unclear as to whether or not okay. they, they're forced to, to abide yeah, or no, not. That's a good so there's a reason why they're unclear. So Mike, this is like another category of this case. So we've, we've seen the case for private employers. These are not government contractors. That's two-thirds of the American workforce, no mandate for them. Then we see the case, okay, for the medical employees, but remember these these hospitals, they take upwards of 70% of of their income coming in is coming in from CMS, Medicaid and Medicare services. But your case is still in the district court. And so there are, depending on where you are, I know Utah even filed in a case in Georgia, and right now the district court there has issued a stay on any mandates for government contractors, uh, but you have to kind of go district by district. So I think your employer's doing the right thing, Mike. They they don't, I, I don't know if they filed and challenged to it, but your state has in Utah. Uh, they're gonna be looking to probably the circuit courts and potentially the US Supreme Court on how this will impact uh, your defense contractor. But as, you, as it was pointed out by you, and I think that this is what's clear is, your employer's doing the right thing. They're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, but so far, Mike, they have not issued any mandate on you, have they? Um, I'm, I'm, va- I'm vaccinated. But like, I'm have you had to give them your card or anything like that yet where they're I, building I, a database? I, I did give them my, my data. I, interestingly enough, Monday I actually contracted um, Omicron. And so I'm actually home now. Yep. So even though I'm fully vaccinated, I actually contracted this so week. I think but- they're in the same position we were th- three days ago which was uh, or four days ago, which is we, we started the good faith compliance with the law because that was, we're lawyers, we comply with the law even if we don't like it. Um, and that was before the testing requirements kicked in. So we started to build a database that's no longer necessary now for us. That's probably what your employer's doing. You know, you can't really rely on just a district court opinion, Dad, but that's where these cases are. They are moving through the district courts, and, and then that'll move to the circuit courts, and then that will impact more states. And and so I think, You're again, right. your employer's going to figure it out for you. Um, and, 
and do the right thing. Yeah, there's a lot of nuances still to be determined on this. Yep. But what the one thing that's clear is this mandate is done for two thirds of the yeah, whole for two workforce. thirds of the workforce. So, and that was good. Now, again, can private? Em- we're getting questions on this, and, and can private employers put in their own protocol? Sure, can't stop a private employer from doing that. That's allowed. So, again. That those are individual decisions that companies made. We put in a filtration system. That was our decision. It wasn't mandated by the government. That was a decision we make. So private employers could have a vaccine mandate. They're allowed to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's allowed. That the government can't compel it. That's the difference here. All right. Welcome back to Seculo. So a big victory. Two thirds of the American workforce free of this federal mandate. Their employer not forced to do anything. Um, The employees, again, it's a huge victory. And it was because, and I want to make it clear, your employer stood up for you. So your state stood up for you. Your your employers, this national, you know, the the Federation of Independent Businesses and and Small Businesses, they they stood up as an entire trade association. Uh, The nonprofit sector, I mean, and the court named that. They said, you know, it's states private employers, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, tr- associations of businesses that all stood up to say, we don't want to be in this position. We know what we need to do, what's best at our small business or our company. Because remember, it was 100 or more employees, so it impacted a lot of small businesses. Let us do what's best. Let's, let us work with the states and the municipalities but we don't need this federal mandate that treats the landscaper and lifeguard the same way as someone working in a meatpacking plant. Well, and that's what they and the court said that. I mean, what, what's good about the opinion is, and it's a procuring opinion, by the way, which means it's, it's unsigned. It's not by, we know it's six to three. There was uh, three justice dissent, but the chief justice, along with Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Barrett, and Justice Kavanaugh, all came to the same conclusion that OSHA did not have the statutory authority to do this. That doesn't mean, again, that... Uh, states can't because they say the states can and they say that Congress can actually in the, in the Gorsuch opinion um, his concurring opinion uh, he believes and, and they say that in the procurement opinion as well but I think what this did and I go back to this fan it does depoliticize this which I think is healthy for the American people and as I said I'm a big advocate of the vaccine as, as you all know I lost a brother to COVID so this is very serious for me and my brother was not vaccinated and I, I you know I regret that but there's nothing I I can't say it over and over again. That doesn't mean the government had the authority to just mandate it through an agency that had no authority to do that in the first place. But I do think it depoliticizes that, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah, Jay, I totally agree with you. I think it's a huge win on a number of fronts. It's clearly a win for liberty. It's clearly a win on a proper recognition of the limits of federal government. I do think it depoliticizes the vaccine and other options available for people that contract COVID. Uh, I've had COVID as well, Jay. I'm also vaccinated. I'm glad to have an individual opportunity uh, to choose the best options for my family and me. I think this this opinion does all of those things. And Jay, I actually think more people are going to choose the vaccine because the government is not mandating it upon them. And I think that's a good thing. I'll tell you one thing, too. I was kind of chuckling as Jordan was going through that timeline because, Jay, you know this is true. This just always happens in Washington, D.C. The biggest issues and the biggest cases always seem to come at the most inconvenient times. You either have a a Friday evening document dump Uh or you have a Thanksgiving and a Christmas holiday where all of the filings are due. But, Jay, look, if you want to fight for liberty, that's what you've got to do, and that's what we do at the ACLJ. I've interviewed lawyers before. This has been years and years ago, and they would say, well, I don't work on this day and I can't work on that. And we said, what if you had an emergency stay at the Supreme Court? I have gotten calls from the Supreme Court in years past on Christmas Eve where they needed something on a case that we were involved in, and it was Christmas Eve. And guess what we did? We responded. And here we responded in record speed. Basically, about for us, about two months' worth of work, six weeks' worth of dates where you had filings and responses and then or argument and then decision. So it, it moved it really quickly here. I mean, if, if you look at it, it, it's remarkable. And I want to thank our entire team. Uh, and that includes our production team. I mean, yesterday was a perfect example. We had a production going on in another studio. We had just finished radio. There was no decision. The decisions came out Thursday morning at 930. Nothing happened. So everybody said, well, that's it. I'm in my office. We're waiting for working on other things. And then all of a sudden the opinion comes. We've got a production going in in a smaller studio next door in our in our building, in our office. And then 
we had we did Jordan and I did Hannity Radio. Took a ten minute break to kind of let our voices rest. As you can tell, our voices are shot a little bit. And then we went and did um, about fifteen minute thing on Facebook and Periscope and all the different social media platforms. But that's because. We're able to do that because of you all. So when we have this victory at the Supreme Court of the United States, and it is a big victory, we want to thank you for that. And I, I think, you know, Wes, you've kind of experienced it by watching this. You, you don't practice law. You're legally trained. You have a master's of law. But you saw it. And it, it was a lot of work and a lot of effort, but a good result. Yeah, a team effort for sure. Not just the team here at ACLJ, but the people who support the ACLJ and our multi-pronged capabilities to affect change and to represent freedom and democracy to defend the Constitution. And again, it's possible because of the people who support the ACLJ. And I know I'm like a lot of the people on staff here. We're just glad we get to be a part of it. We're going to Mary's call in Virginia online too. Hey, Mary, welcome to Seculo. You're on the air. Thank you. Yes, um, the question I had uh, for you, Jay, was um, now that the uh, Supreme Court has um, uh, gotten rid of the mandate, um, our companies... Uh, that are um, with 100 employees or more still yes. going to be mandating the um, requirements for the vaccine because I feel the company I work for is still going to be mandating it. Yeah, well, they can. And, and they don't have to be 100 employees. It could be 10 employees. I mean, private companies can say, look, we mandated a filtration system in our offices. We put them in offices all over our facilities and not just here in our other office locations as well. So private employers still have the capability of saying, you know what, if you're going to work here, we're going to require a vaccine. Uh, that That's there's nothing in the law that prohibits a private employer for setting workplace conditions. No, I think the only thing they have to offer is probably a religious exemption. Yes. The government made that argument in court. So but even the did. Biden administration now that. And for people who uh, really cannot get the vaccine because they're immunocompromised, uh, obviously you, they're not going to be terminated because of that. So there's right. still going to have to be some uh, system set up within even a, a private employer who decides to do this on their own that allows for certain exemptions based off either religious exemptions or – uh, this would damage your body in a way because you're immunocompromised. And that's a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, let me go back to the phones again. Linda in Texas on line four. Hey, Linda. Quickly, Linda, go ahead. Hello. Um, my name is Linda, and I'm a nurse. Yes. And I work at a um, Title I okay. school district. A lot yep. of our students are Medicaid. Yes. Uh, as a nurse, I don't trust the COVID vaccine science period, but also it's not a win for us nurses if we participate in companies that take Medicare, Medicaid. Well, here's the if issue. Here's the issue, Linda. While you, a lot of nurses challenged it and individuals and states, your employer didn't. The hospitals didn't. The hospital, and I'm not saying just yours specifically, no hospitals. So the Supreme Court noted that was a close decision, too, 5-4. I think that if the actual employers would have been there making that case of how many Maybe they're losing, it may, but but no one was there back. Yeah. No one was there to file that affidavit from the employer to right. say, you know, we can't operate as a hospital because this is impacting too many of, of our nurses and doctors and staff. So I would take this up, as the Supreme Court noted, your your employer didn't challenge it for you. That's just the bottom line. And it's, it was noted. It was a big enough deal that it was noted by the Supreme Court in that decision. No, that's, that's why Heritage, groups like that, stood up for their employees. The, but also the small yeah, businesses and, stood up for their employees. Yeah, and listen, and Heritage has, has not been anti-vax at no, all. No, but they stood up. They didn't want that weird— They didn't want the government engaged in something that the government didn't have the authority to do. That's what this case Separation was all about. Powers. Separation of powers. Separation powers and federalism. But I want to thank you for supporting the work of the American Center for Law and Justice. This was a big win at the Supreme Court of the United States. I hope it depoliticizes this whole issue. And people forget that this vaccine was created under President Donald Trump through warp speed. And it's probably saved, not probably, it has saved millions of lives. But the government was not in the position to do what they were trying to do here. And that was the right decision of the Supreme Court. When we see something, when we hear something, when we're concerned about an issue, we don't just talk about it. We do something about it.
And that goes to our government accountability project. The things that are important are knowing where to look and who to look at. What we're trying to do is get information that we the people are entitled to. We sort of call them puzzle pieces because we don't know which ones we're going to need in the long run. But you gather all the puzzle pieces together and then you start to put them together to uncover the truth, really. The Freedom of Information Act, that's a statute that allows us to get information from the government. Starts with a letter from our offices in Washington to these agencies. And it says, give us this information on these topics. And generally, they don't. And then we go to court. We go through a series of lengthy negotiations back and forth about what they'll give or what they won't give. We may get tons of information that's redacted, and we have to then go back and say, you redacted too much. We can't really find out what you're giving us because it makes no sense. So it goes through a process of litigation. That is how you get information, and that office is going to be more active now more than ever. The ACLJ has been extremely active in vigorously seeking to to hold these bureaucrats accountable. We have filed hundreds of FOIA requests. We have received over 20,000 pages of documents in our litigation. How was our government operating? What were they driving at? What was their agenda? What was their motive? And I will tell you, I mean, sometimes the picture that it paints is one of terrific abuse. You're finding a nugget in a gold mine. Occasionally, you'll come up with something that is really a bombshell, but you have to persist in doing it, and that's what we do. That is a, that's a, is a little bit of what we do through our Office of Government Accountability, and of course, that comes under our Office of Government Affairs. So your support of the ACLJ supports all of that.